Welcome to the live uh, online chat entitled Preventive and Therapeutic Strategies for the Onset of Cardiomyopathy Related to Muscular Dystrophy. I'm Dr. Jeff Tobin, the Executive Co-Director of the Heart Institute and the Chief of Pediatric Cardiology at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. Tonight we're going to be chatting with you all about the heart disease related to muscular dystrophy, some of the preventive aspects, as well as the treatment strategies that we've used over the years with this disorder. Next to me is my colleague, Dr. John Lynn Jeffries. Um, and let me take a minute first to introduce myself before I ask Dr. Jeffries to do so with a little bit of background. So I've been interested in pediatric cardiomyopathy and heart failure since I became a faculty member or a pediatric cardiologist in 1989, and have been equally interested in muscular dystrophy and its associated heart muscle problems since that time. As a pediatric cardiologist, I focused my attention on heart muscle diseases over these 20 plus years, including that associated with muscular dystrophy, other syndromes, as well as those individuals with simple forms of heart muscle disease not related to uh, various um, myopathies or syndromes. In addition, my interests are in the basic science laboratory where I've discovered and my lab has discovered many genes. And in fact, we were the first laboratory to identify dystrophin, the gene related to Duchenne muscular dystrophy as a cause of what's called X-linked dilated cardiomyopathy, a form of heart failure related to the dystrophin gene with limited amounts of muscle disease, simply a pure form of heart muscle problem. So interest over the past 20 plus years in heart muscle disease, many uh, areas of progress have occurred. I've been a participant in much of that over the years and continue to do so. At Cincinnati Children's Hospital, we're very interested in this topic, uh, both muscular dystrophy as well as heart muscle disease. Uh, we have a very large uh, inpatient and outpatient clinic uh, regarding heart muscle disease as well as muscular dystrophy itself and the overlap of the cardiomyopathies uh, and, and muscular dystrophy. My colleague, Dr. Jeffries, uh, and I have been together for a number of years and I'd like for him to give you his background as well. Len? Thank you, Dr. Tobin. So uh, my background is uh, both in adult cardiology and pediatric cardiology. So I received fellowship training at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston and specialized in cardiovascular genetics, so specifically in neuromuscular disorders, as well as um, heart failure and cardiomyopathies, both in children, adolescents, young adults, and older adults. So that offers a unique spectrum to what we do uh, in our uh, neuromuscular clinic, specifically caring for uh, patients with muscular dystrophy because it affords us the opportunity to take care of patients both at a very young age up uh, until they're uh, very advanced in age. The other unique uh, possibility that that includes is the opportunity to seek uh, as to see uh, carrier mothers as well. And so uh, we really have no age limitations. I think the other thing to underscore for our clinic is that it's a very integrated clinic with a very large clinical experience, recognizing that it's multidisciplinary in nature. So not only is the cardiovascular care there, but also pulmonary care and neurology care. So I think the level of sophistication is very high. My uh, clinical interests are, uh, revolve around novel therapies, uh, preventive strategies for patients with heart muscle disease, as in uh, neuromuscular disorders uh, such as muscular dystrophy, and then advanced heart failure therapies such as uh, uh, pacing strategies and mechanical support strategies for those patients that have advanced um, myocardial dysfunction and they're really in need of, of uh, uh, therapies that wouldn't typically be delivered at most institutions. I should say that Dr. Jeffries is the director of our cardiomyopathy and advanced heart failure program as well as our mechanical circulatory support, also known as ventricular assist device or VAD program. Uh, and should also mention that in addition to both of us seeing a very large number of patients uh, currently and over the years uh, with these disorders, um, we also um, 
have written many of the articles on these topics. Together, we've published approximately 500 papers, mostly on these particular topics. Uh, we also have lots of support in the Heart Institute um, and at Cincinnati Children's Hospital with our neuromuscular program matrix of, uh, of neuromuscular physicians, um, pulmonary physicians, and others. Uh, we have a genetics team. Uh, Dr. Jeffries and I are very um, experienced in cardiovascular genetics of these disorders as well. And so we try to cover the entirety of a patient and a family care experience. We're hosting tonight's event uh, because we've been hearing that there are many questions regarding uh, the heart uh, in muscular dystrophy. Uh, and since we have a lot of experience and a large clinic, we felt that we could be a resource to people uh, if there are questions out there uh, that you had, we'd be more than thrilled uh, to try to answer them. Um, so Dr. Jeffries and I are going to field the questions together. Uh, he's going to read the questions and then we'll answer them depending on uh, which one of us wants to field it. Feel free to start sending questions in. We'll get them queued up and start to answer them immediately. So please enter each question only once. If we're uh, unable to, uh, to get to it, we'll send a follow-up email with answers to all the questions within a couple of days. So thanks for joining and um, have at us. So uh, we actually do have an initial question here from TDEC, uh, which asks, what treatments have been proven the most effective? Uh, so uh, meaning what medical therapies would be most effective? So Dr. Tobin. So let's make a few assumptions to start with. The first assumption is that there is actually heart muscle disease, meaning that the left ventricle of the heart, the major pumping chamber, is too big and that it pumps not good enough, so-called dilated cardiomyopathy. Those individuals uh, in our clinic get treated. We treat them typically with one or more therapies. If there is mild or no symptoms, we will typically start with what we call an ACE, ACE inhibitor, so-called PRIL drugs. Those would be captopril, enalapril, those kind of drugs, tend to be our start point. We may or may not add early on or even later a second therapy, which tends to be a so-called beta blocker. Uh, these are the OLAL drugs. We tend to use carvedilol in this patient population most frequently. Sometimes we'll use metoprolol. Those tend to be the two big sets. If an individual has too much fluid or volume uh, or has respiratory issues based on fluid in the lungs, we may also use a so-called diuretic, uh, a water pill, if you will, so that the individual will urinate the excess fluid off. Uh, drugs like Lasix or furosemide tend to be the typical drugs used there. So those tend to be the early therapies that we would use. Um, and as I mentioned, we usually start with one at a time unless there's more substantial issues at the time of presentation. So that would be therapy if you have a dilated cardiomyopathy. You know, we would also add you know, that there are advanced strategies to that, uh, meaning that um, uh, individualization of therapy would be important based on the presenting symptomatology that we would deal with would be dealing with in an individual but these are very tried and true therapies that have been um, utilized with great success in patients with heart failure in the general population but more importantly um, based on data that we've published in the past have been shown to be hugely effective in patients that have muscular dystrophy in this dilated cardiomyopathy so um, there are a lot of alternative treatment strategies out there, but these have been proven, at least in our experience, to be highly effective. So we have another question from uh, TDEC who asks, um, why would we think that the early diagnosis of heart issues and muscular dystrophy would be of great importance? And so for us, we, we've uh, been through various paradigms about when to screen patients, um, and we've elected to start screening patients at a very early age simply because we feel like that an earlier recognition uh, of uh, heart muscle disease can lead to earlier institution of therapy. Um, and we think that that's of uh, significance, significant importance uh, simply because uh, 
um, we, every patient is a little bit different at the onset, the timing of their cardiomyopathy. And traditional strategies have usually employed things like echocardiography or other non-invasive modalities to assess for heart muscle disease. Um, we've actually taken that to uh, more advanced paradigms, including very uh, cutting edge technologies in the form of, of imaging. Uh, and we've leveraged cardiac MRI or magnetic resonance imaging uh, to better diagnose uh, heart muscle disease given that this technology affords us so much more information about the heart muscle itself including chamber sizes and if there's any presence of scar or fibrosis in the heart muscle itself. The other thing that we've utilized is more advanced approaches to blood testing recognizing that there are things that may be happening in the heart muscle where there are proteins circulating in the blood that may give us evidence of early damage to the heart muscle that we couldn't typically detect by using a thing like by using things like echocardiography or even MRI. So we've tried to be very comprehensive in the way we assess patients, but we also recognize that every patient is an individual and that using a standard operating age for when we expect cardiac disease uh, to present itself really isn't applicable to an individual. And so really being thoughtful, capturing patients as early as possible instituting therapies when they're appropriate in our mind lends itself to the best outcome. Um, we have another question as well. Um, we have uh, uh, from Partners Hub, uh, Angela's, Angela asks, um, what are some of the symptoms noticed with dilated cardiomyopathy? So a little, a little bit depends on the age of the individual uh, as well as the ambulatory nature of that individual. Um, People who are already wheelchair bound uh, tend to have symptoms much later in the course of their dilated cardiomyopathy than those individuals who are co continue to be ambulatory. So for instance, individuals with Becker muscular dystrophy who are still ambulatory versus those later in their course with Duchenne. Let's start with the Duchenne patient. Um, those individuals uh, tend to, as I mentioned, be later onset from the standpoint of symptoms, and that tends to be most frequently associated with rapid breathing. It may not be overt, obvious rapid breathing. It may be related to shorter breaths, but sometimes it's difficult to tell whether or not that's a respiratory problem associated with muscular dystrophy, or it's a cardiac problem. New onset, uh, will be a differentiating factor. Occasionally, we'll also see uh, some swelling of the extremities. Again, this is a later finding. And so many of these uh, young adults and children will present to the cardiologist fairly late in their dilated cardiomyopathy because the symptoms are difficult because they're not ambulatory. Much easier to identify symptoms in the ambulatory patient and again, it's associated with respiratory findings, typically associated with activity. So climbing upstairs is hard enough, but this would be a difference. So getting short of breath much quicker than, than in the past would be one. Another finding that sometimes triggers an evaluation for this would be palpitations or a funny beating in the chest. Um, Another would be excess sweating. We see that occasionally, not typically, but occasionally. Those would be some of the findings that would quickly be concerning for heart. Another finding associated with the heart that sometimes is not obvious to people is abdominal pain. Sometimes your liver could get big because of the heart failure and give you abdominal pain, which actually is because of the heart and not so much because uh, of uh, what the other sources of belly pain might be. So those would be the typical symptoms that we would see on first pass. Len, anything yeah, to add? I think the other thing to, to underscore that is that many times patients are asymptomatic and that comes back to this concept of screening, recognizing that patients may have evidence of myocardial dysfunction or heart squeeze problems based on echo or on MRI, but uh, that there's also uh, uh, those don't always aren't uh, accompanied by cardiovascular symptoms as Dr. Tobin was describing. So I think that's very important. Other things such as fatigability, uh, sometimes we'll notice um, a decrease in patient appetite. 
uh, you know, that so the appetite just seems to fall off for no apparent reason and is persistently falling off. Sometimes sleep habits will be uh, uh, abnormal and patients may be sleeping a lot more than typical or if they have evidence of pulmonary congestion they actually may sleep less because of uh, associ associated shortness of breath. So all those things can uh, the, the, the challenging uh, thing about that is that sometimes those symptoms are relatively nondescript and could be associated with many problems. Um, so really it comes back to having access to uh, thoughtful cardiovascular care to do appropriate screening to help you to understand if the symptoms that you may be experiencing is that you've heard about are actually cardiac related or could they be pulmonary related or something else for that matter. So important thing to factor in. But the classic um, symptoms were as Dr. Tobin described, but many times we see patients that are completely asymptomatic that have pretty significant involvement of their heart muscle. And so that makes this a unique population, I think, to care for uh, in many ways, simply because symptoms may not be present, but uh, overt cardiovascular disease really may be there, something that's responsive to therapy, such as the diuretics that you heard about earlier, but without careful imaging studies and investigation, it actually would be missed otherwise. So I think that would be an important takeaway. So let's just add one other thing to the asymptomatic individual who has dilated cardiomyopathy. That's going to be the majority of patients early in the course for certain. One of the key reasons to be seen younger in life and to be seen by a cardiologist as part of the follow-up long term is to be able to make those diagnoses early on. Much easier for us to manage the long-term heart when we treat it early on than to see someone who's already well down the path of symptoms uh, who has a, a heart that's really working quite poorly where we're, we're really shortchanging our ability to really fully care for that individual. So it really goes back to the prevention aspect. And prevention is key because of the fact that many, if not most individuals, are going to start out asymptomatic and may be asymptomatic for a very long time while they still have heart muscle disease. So being seen early and relatively frequently from the perspective of, uh, at least on an annual basis, for instance, even when you have no findings associated with disease, is critical. The earlier we find the problem, and the earlier we can treat it, the longer the, the outcome is likely to be because these medications, when treated early, tend to do a pretty good job of reducing progression quite substantially. I think the other critical piece that we've observed, I think, in clinical practice is that when we start seeing symptoms in our muscular dystrophy population, typically the disease is relatively advanced. And so that comes back to that idea of Earlier recognition means you're starting with a better substrate to try and treat and the outcomes are typically going to be better as opposed to being very far down the road having symptoms uh, because of, of really significant myocardial dysfunction or heart squeeze problems. It makes it very uh, much more challenging I think clinically for us to be able to treat that heart muscle disease effectively and really changing the outcome. So that really comes back to the idea of early screening, um, early diagnosis in our mind makes a big difference. So our next question, Debbie asks, what age would you recommend an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor for a boy with Duchenne? And at what age should they have a cardiac MRI for a boy with uh, DMD? So I'll answer the second question. I'll let Dr. Tobin answer the first as he sort of alluded to this a little bit earlier. So in our program, we've um, heavily utilized cardiac MRI and uh, I can give you a few of the basic reasons, but if you think about echocardiography as a technology, and even if you've observed an echocardiogram, you can appreciate that we can see the cardiac structure, we can see size to a reasonable degree, but it's sound wave technology. So as patients get bigger, as their chest walls become a little more dis distorted, especially in the muscular dystrophy population, the ability to effectively utilize ultrasound becomes increasingly limited. We have some opportunities to make that a little bit better, but not a lot better. And at the end of the day, we're looking at shades of gray on an echocardiogram is the way to think about it. And we can get an idea of the way the heart squeezes in a global fashion and even in regional areas of the heart muscle itself. But we can't really get good ideas of what the heart muscle really looks like in any great degree. 
and we can't really um, reliably and reproducibly calculate chamber sizes and the way that the heart muscle actually squeezes or the so-called ejection fraction. MRI affords us a very unique opportunity to look at these chambers in great uh, detail in a three-dimensional way. We can calculate the size of these chambers based on volumetric measurements in a very reproducible way. We can look for areas of the heart muscle that don't work very well and do that very consistently. And the other special aspect of MRI that we can't really utilize echo for in as great detail is to look for evidence of myocardial damage or scar or fibrosis. We can actually use uh, a contrast agent called gadolinium that helps us to understand if there are areas of the heart muscle that have been damaged in any way. And this would be our standard approach to patients that have Duchenne or any other um, uh, concern of cardiomyopathy where we're utilizing cardiac MRI. And we do this, um, you know, uh, comparatively much more than most institutions in the country simply because we feel like that it offers this unique opportunity to characterize the myocardium or the heart muscle for that individual patient. And it gives us a baseline that we can follow over time to see if the squeeze changes, if the chamber size changes, if uh, the amount of scar goes from being none to some to a lot. And that actually dictates or helps us to understand the appropriate medical therapies moving forward. So back to the question about at what age would we start? If there's a specific indication, we could do a cardiac MRI at any age. However, for children, um, it becomes a little more challenging than an adult because it requires them to lie still for a very extended period of time. So uh, in younger children, many times that necessitates general anesthesia. So we've been reticent to do that in very young populations unless there's a real clear-cut clinical indication simply because of the potential risk that's associated with being put to sleep. And patients, as they get become more mature and can understand what we're trying to accomplish with the imaging and that can lie still, we actually can do the MRI without all of this anesthesia um, uh, uh, being a part of the procedure itself. It makes it a lot safer, a lot easier on the patients, and it actually condenses the time that they actually have to be in the scanner. And so our practices, I'll usually start, I just individualize it, to be honest. We don't have a necessarily a set age, but I base it on the maturity level of the patient start thinking that patients are, could, should be considered, but we have some patients that actually are more than capable of doing it at a younger age than that. So hopefully that helps you to understand our age policy. And then, Dr. Tobin, do you want to address the ACE inhibitor use? Sure. We don't really have an age uh, when we start uh, any of the therapies, including ACE inhibitors. It's really based on the clinical features. Now, that said, there's a couple of caveats uh, that uh, I should throw out there that have something to do with what your second part of your question was regarding cardiac MRI. So one of the nice things that uh, Dr. Jeffries alluded to with cardiac MR is that we get a much more bird's eye view of the ventricular muscle than we can with echocardiography. We know from years past uh, to the current that there are certain parts of the left ventricle, the major pumping chamber of the heart, that are affected first and affect other parts of that left ventricle. For instance, in the bottom part of the left ventricle, there is an area where the mitral valve, the swinging door, if you will, that opens to allow blood to go from the top chamber, the left atrium, to the bottom chamber. And that apparatus links directly to the bottom of the heart. That part of the bottom of the heart is one of the first areas that develop scar. And so one of the first things you could start seeing before the heart muscle looks dysfunctional is that the mitral valve itself is a little loose. We call it mitral valve prolapse. Also in that part of the heart, you can have functional abnormalities that look different from the rest of the heart. It doesn't move quite as well. And that might be an early feature of heart muscle disease in addition to early scarring. That may lead us down the path of earlier treatment than if we saw on an echocardiogram a ventricle that either was too big or poorly functional, which would be the usual criteria for using these medications. There are other discussions that have been ongoing that are a little more controversial. So for instance, in most patients before you develop abnormalities of imaging, you will start developing, for instance, elevated heart rates. 
So one question becomes, is that cardiac? Is the, is the heart rate faster because the heart is starting to become effective? If that's the case, should you treat it earlier? There's actually no data in that. It's a good question. Uh, some people use therapy early on and some don't, but the data is still out there. But cardiac MR helps you to start distinguishing these things so that we can give you an answer that really makes sense moving forward. So no age. We like to see some abnormality, and it could be mild on a cardiac MRI, or it could be something more obvious that will lead us down the path. But whenever we see an abnormality, that's when we'll start therapy. And as I mentioned, it will usually start with ACE inhibitors, at least in our group. Mm -hmm. So Leandra asks, my son presents with beta thalassemia intermedia and Duchenne and is five years old. My question is, would preventive cardiac medications be recommended, and at what point uh, would they be introduced? So, Dr. Tobin, you want to? Uh, thank you. So uh, the short answer to that is uh, no, not unless there's cardiovascular abnormalities, but there's a caveat. And the caveat is dependent on what's going on with the beta-thal, which mm -hmm. can lead to other treatments that your hematologist would be providing, number one. And number two, there are also other forms of cardiovascular disease that might be associated with, uh, with beta-thal or globinopathies in general. Mm -hmm. So for instance, uh, there is another form of heart muscle disease called restrictive cardiomyopathy that looks different, that has different features and different outcomes that one would have to pay attention to and when you have a combination of disorders that may lead down the path of cardiac disease independently, but now you're coupling them, you may have earlier onset or even more severe problems or even a different clinical feature than you would be expecting from either one. So knowing that the individual has both problems is step one. That's a great start point. Knowing you have it is important and having the cardiologist and the hematologists both know about both diseases is critical so that they're working together. This is a team sport. So we have to work together uh, in order to get the best outcome. So in someone with muscular dystrophy, you're all wor already working with the neuromuscular team. You may be working with a pulmonologist. You may be working with a cardiologist. And in your case, you ought to be working with a hematologist who's linking back to the previous three that I just mentioned. So think team, and the best outcomes will occur if people are talking together and you're doing what you just did, which is ask great questions so that we will stay on our toes and keep all of those things in mind because it's very hard to manage a big chart that has lots of details. And so you, the parent, have to really keep us uh, apprised of all of the things going on. Don't assume we know everything from every part because it's hard to do that, even though we should. We don't always communicate in a timely manner. So hopefully that helps. And I think I would, I would uh, echo that. It's a very good question. I think as a cardiologist, we recognize that there's a lot that we don't know. And the idea that there could be um, uh, concurrent illness such as beta-thal that could uh, alter our cardiovascular picture really may change how we frequently we would see a patient, perhaps the timing of therapies. As Dr. Tobin alluded to, the typicals that we may look for may not be typical in that particular scenario. So it really would have us give us cause to step back and revisit things, I think, in a more thoughtful way. And that's a, it's not uncommon for us to see patients with muscular dystrophy that have concurrent illness that could affect cardiovascular status. So I think it's coming back to being uh, in a center where a, a very complete approach is employed to make sure that the best care is delivered. I should make one other point, and that is that in, in certain um, hematologic disorders, uh, some of the therapies may be the use of hydration, intravenous uh, therapy uh, with, uh, with hydration. If you have heart muscle disease and it's unrecognized, too much fluid won't be good for you. And so that becomes an important factor in the therapy of the hematologic disorder and again, working together with your cardiologist who's working together, uh, particularly if, uh, if an individual is hospitalized or in an ICU with a hospitalist or the intensive care doctor so that they understand that doing one thing affects another.
And again, it becomes uh, this team approach really is important. So speak up, ask questions, make sure people understand what they're dealing with, and I think you'll help us uh, keep uh, your child out of trouble with the approaches we take if we don't know the whole picture. So an important question. Yeah, and the other piece would be that sometimes that sort of volume expansion or hydration uh, form is, uh, comes in the form of blood transfusion, which can also have pretty significant effects on myocardial function over time. One of the beauties of using things like MRI is that we could actually uh, help to understand things like iron deposition, which could be a, a secondary effect of being transfused frequently. So a uh, very good question and, and a very important topic, I think. So next question, Tony asks us, can you give any uh, diet advice for a Duchenne child with regard to promoting heart health? This is a wonderful question and one that we actually were just talking about in our clinic a few weeks ago. So as a part of our clinic structure, we actually utilize a nutritionist that's involved with every patient. I won't go into too much of the specifics about dietary recommendations for skeletal muscle disease, but we'll talk a little bit about some of the cardiac concerns or things that we would promote. Um, a lot of it is about healthy uh, diet, as we would promote as a, you know, as a cardiac patient, anyone recognizing the avoidance of things like processed foods and saturated fats and those sorts of things could really have deleterious effects on long-term outcome. And that's something that we're starting to be more appreciative of. I would say that now that we're seeing an aging population in our clinics, that many of the typical diseases that would be seen in the general population, such as uh, lipid abnormalities, triglyceride abnormalities, diabetes, all these other sorts of things really have to be factored in because the longevity is changing so much. So we're really big into, into good uh, dietary health. The thing that we think about from a cardiomyopathy perspective is this, and that the analogy that I used uh, for patients most of the time that have heart muscle disease is that even though that patient is sitting still, they're running a marathon meaning by definition they're catabolic, they're burning lots and lots of calories. And so their calorie deficits are often quite significant, even though you wouldn't think so. So that's where having access to a nutritionist is critical, I think. The other piece for us is that we know having the right substrate for the heart muscle to work properly is important. So having good healthy fats in the diet, having appropriate carbohydrates in the diet, and for us a big one is protein. And so recognizing that we want to have adequate protein stores and protein access to patients of heart muscle disease simply because that can have a big impact on how heart muscle works over time. The thing that we have to be cognizant of is that um, we can't uh, overdo therapies, especially in the form of protein, uh, in the setting of any concomitant renal dysfunction or anything like that. So having a, a thorough approach is of importance. And also making sure that the typical vitamins and minerals and those sorts of things are appropriately supplemented, recognizing that some vitamins, if they're deficient in the diet, can actually lead to heart muscle disease independent of having neuromuscular disorders. So all those things are very important. Um, and I think that's where having access to good nutrition, uh, being having very thoughtful detail of a, of a patient's intake, doing supplements as needed is very important because at the end of the day, we could give you wonderful medical therapies for your heart muscle disease, but if your nutrition is poor, you won't respond very well. And it's just that simple that we talk about ACE inhibitors and beta blockers and these sorts of things, but there are basic things that families can do that can greatly impact a patient's outcome, and I think that this is absolutely one of them. So being proactive about dietary status, being well-informed, and recognizing that all the things that we talk about, whether it's cardiac or nutrition, these aren't stagnant processes. These are dynamic processes, just as your child ages and uh, they're going to have different food interests. All these sorts of things require that you revisit these issues on every visit to make sure that we're checking the boxes appropriately and addressing things early. Um, but for us, diet is a, is a huge component of what we think a good outcome revolves around. Agreed. So next question, um, and this is from Andrew. Um, what is the typical course of treatment for a 16-month-old with left ventricular non-compaction? My 16-month-old has an enlarged left atrium, um, but otherwise healthy and thriving. And we're going to answer this question based on um, the uh, presumption that this is LVNC in the face of muscular dystrophy, which we do know can be seen. 
Um, but obviously we have a lot of experience with left ventricular non-compaction in the non-neuromuscular population as well, but uh, our answer would be uh, pretty much standard. So Dr. Tobin. So um, this will be a little bit of a long answer. Yeah. Um, so That's first right. of all, um, just to reiterate a point that Dr. Jeffries just made, we talk about dilated cardiomyopathy as the cardiomyopathy associated with Duchenne muscular dystrophy or the muscular dystrophies in general, and in large part, that's true. However, left ventricular non-compaction does occur. We're not sure what frequency, but it's probably way under-recognized, and I'll tell you why that is in a moment. Um, and so it's real, and it really occurs uh, not just in muscular dystrophy patients, but is a relatively common form of cardiomyopathy in the childhood population in general. So let's talk a little bit about non-compaction as a generalization, since uh, it's probably going to be a little different that if you've heard about this, what I'm going to tell you might be a little different than what you've heard. So left ventricular non-compaction means that in the left ventricle, again, the major pumping chamber of the heart that's on the left side bottom, uh, which pumps to the whole body all of the red blood, that chamber tends to be somewhat spherical in nature, smooth-walled in nature on the inside. The right ventricle, on the other hand, tends to be more triangular and not so smooth-walled and, in fact, has these little finger processes of tissue that we call trabeculations. That's normal in the right ventricle. The right ventricle is thin-walled because it pumps into the lungs at low pressure. The left ventricle is thicker because it pumps against a higher pressure to the whole body. So the right ventricle has normal finger processes or trabeculations. The left ventricle tends to not. Left ventricular non-compaction means that in the left ventricle, there are these trabeculations in addition to what you see in the right ventricle, and they're notable. You can see them. They're obvious. And there are some criteria that people use to, to say whether or not it has enough trabeculations or not to call left ventricular non-compaction. I actually don't believe that that is a, an appropriate set of criteria, but it doesn't really matter for this discussion. So when you're talking about left ventricular non-compaction, you're talking about a left ventricle with trabeculations to a, of a certain degree. That's, that's the definition. However, it's an inappropriate definition for a number of reasons. And that is that the, they don't all look the same. So what you have to do is you have to break them down into subgroups. In other words, instead of lumping them all together as one of left ventricular non-compaction, you have to split them. So the various subtypes of non-compaction include a left ventricle that has a normal chamber size, a normal thickness of the chamber, and a normal squeezing of that chamber. We tend to call that the benign form unless there's arrhythmias associated, which has a different outcome because of the arrhythmias. Then there's a form where the ventricle is dilated with poor functioning, a so-called dilated cardiomyopathy form. This would be the most typical one we would see in, uh, in Duchenne or Becker muscular dystrophy, although you can see the other form earlier uh, before it dilates, the so-called hypertrophic form, where the walls are thick and typically the squeezing is better than normal, but the relaxation is not so good. Then there's a form that overlaps that has dilated, thick, and poorly functioning ventricles, uh, a dilated hypertrophic form, if you will. And then there's a form that has normal left ventricular size, normal left ventricular thickness, and normal squeezing of that chamber but the left atrium, in this case, what we're talking about, I believe, is dilated. And that can be one of two things. That can either be a dilated left atrium because, as I mentioned earlier, you might have mitral valve prolapse, in which case you could get leaking of the mitral valve, regurgitation of blood from the left ventricle. Instead of it all going out to the body, some of it can go backwards, back into the left atrium, making the left atrium dilated, sort of like a water balloon, if you will. Too much water or too much blood in that chamber, dilating it. It's a thin wall chamber. Or you can have a dilated left atrium 
in the face of a normal mitral valve, no regurgitation, and we call that restrictive cardiomyopathy or restrictive physiology, which is a more significant problem from a cardiomyopathy perspective than if you had the leaky valve. And then there's another form associated with congenital heart disease, and those would be your five or six different forms. So the devil's in the details. If this is a dilated left atria uh, with otherwise everything else normal, we would consider that a restrictive form of non-compaction, uh, which would get close follow-up and a number of other things. And if you have specifics you want to ask, because it's related to that, you should send us an offline email um, and we can be more specific. But I think that would cover pretty much uh, the various features uh, of, um, of the question you asked. Now, if it's dilated, uh, you get treated the same way as you would, as I mentioned earlier, with ACE inhibitors, beta blockers. Uh, so it doesn't really change the therapy for uh, a Duchenne or Becker patient, for instance, associated with non-compaction if you're dilated. Yeah, and I think, you know, a lot of what our management strategy would entail would really be trying to obtain more information alluding to what Dr. Tobin was saying, is that how can we best explain why this atrium is dilated? Sometimes that involves the imaging technology that you utilize, meaning that um, is it dilated on an echocardiogram, but on something like an MRI, that it actually turns out to be within normal limits. But if it, if it, it is really dilated, I think that would, it would trigger in our clinic a lot of responses, and one of the things that we would be concerned about would be the potential for unusual heart rhythms or arrhythmias, simply because that, that top chamber is becoming dilated and disrupting the electrical system that, that exists around the heart. It can become irritated and manifest itself in the form of atrial and ventricular tachyarrhythmias. So it would be important for us to know because that may have prognostic information, but more importantly, it offers a real important piece of information regarding treatment and something that we would do surveillance-wise. So typically for folks, as a part, we didn't really talk about this, but as a part of our standard strategies, we recognize that patient with Duchenne, and depending of having dilated left atria, which we do occasionally see, are very prone to unusual heart rhythms. And so as a part of our standard uh, approach, we talk a lot about imaging and looking for dilated cardiomyopathy, but we looked at a very large cohort of patients with muscular dystrophy and recognized that many of these patients have unusual heart rhythms or arrhythmias that are subclinical, meaning they don't feel the heartbeat palpitation sort of problems, they don't become dizzy, they don't pass out. So the way that we uh, gain information about those patients is by doing Holter monitoring or surveillance looking for unusual heartbeats. And we can do more advanced strategies in that direction if we think we need to look more in depth for an individual. So a great question, important one. Um, management of left ventricular non-compaction is a little bit different. Um, if you develop that dilated phenotype that Dr. Tobin was talking about, you know, the standard uh, approach would be the one that we would employ, just as he outlined. But you have to be also cognizant about the potential for thromboembolic, so blood clots and those sorts of things. And so talking about potential for being on aspirin therapy and those sorts of things may also be a consideration. So we'd be glad to talk more about that case if, if you were interested. Now we've written a moderate amount about this mm -hmm. topic, so if you uh, look us up, uh, you could see some of the work Absolutely. that we've written that might be of some help. Yeah. So we'll move on to our next question. It's from Valerie, and she asks, My six-year-old son has muscular dystrophy. When should his heart be evaluated? And so from our perspective, we talked a little bit about this briefly. You know, um, I think an answer to your direct question is that it's not unreasonable to be evaluated now um, for your six-year-old son. We, we used to, I think, have a sort of fixed idea of when we thought that cardiovascular disease manifested in patients with muscular dystrophy. But then you have to step back and ask yourself, how do you define cardiac disease? And in the past, it would have been based on what we would consider relatively rudimentary technologies today. Now with these advanced technologies that I was telling you about, and we can really drill down and look at the heart muscle in a very specific and localized way, we can detect changes in the way that the, the, way heart, the heart deforms, so the way that it hearts, the heart squeezes by very advanced imaging techniques that we do on all of our patients to look for early evidence of disease. 
So the idea of when do you develop cardiac disease, well, it depends, I think, in part on how do you define cardiac disease. If you're talking about classic dilated cardiomyopathy, that's a different answer than when you develop fibrosis or scar. And so for us, we recognize that every patient is a little bit different. And so we do think that early screening gives us the best chance to find these early changes. And I, Dr. Tobin had alluded to this earlier, but it's something that we want to reiterate, is that we really want to be uh, heavily invested in preventive and early diagnostic strategies. We think that that's a big part of what we need to be offering as a clinic and delivering care to this population. So just to add one other point, uh, and that is uh, if the mutation in the dystrophin gene mm -hmm. is known and mom is a carrier, this is a good opportunity to think of yourself, and I'll ask Dr. Jeffries to speak of this uh, for a moment, but one of the other reasons to get seen early with your child, your son, with muscular dystrophy is for mom, who's a carrier in particular, to get into the system as well. And you want to speak a little to that? Yes, so, and this uh, actually ties into a question from Stacy. so I'll read that. Should I get my heart checked since I am a carrier for Duchenne? And the answer is yes. And uh, as I said, I, I think we're probably currently the only dedicated program in the country that's uh, seeing carrier moms and um, simply because it's an area of, of great need. In our clinical experience, and definitely my experience as an adult cardiologist, um, most uh, adult uh, care delivery systems wouldn't really recognize your risk of heart muscle disease as a carrier. Uh, and it's very important because it sends you down a pathway of looking for multiple etiologies, including blocked coronary arteries and other things. And at the end of the day, you'd most likely be tagged with idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy as, your, as the terminology for your heart disease. But actually, we know what the cause of your heart disease is. It's a dystrophin abnormality. The thing that's very important about, I think, the carrier population is that we still don't know a lot about the cardiovascular manifestations. Um, there are very limited papers out there if you look on the internet. There's a very recent study just a few months ago that came out uh, in a neurology journal that gave some follow-up information on uh, female carriers uh, in the development of heart failure and heart muscle disease. And what I would tell you is that the typical way that many of these studies started out was based on some of those technologies that we alluded to earlier, meaning the form of echocardiography and other things. Um, what we've tried to do is be uh, as comprehensive as we can be for the mothers, just as we would be for the boys, recognizing we have access to cutting edge technologies to, to offer early diagnostic strategies to patients that are carriers. And what we hope to do is actually sort of uh, redefine this population, considering that the data are very sparse to begin with. And it's that same question about how do you define heart muscle disease and heart involvement. For us, we feel very strongly about the idea of developing um, strategies to try and uh, employ early diagnosis, which leads to early treatment. And the other thing is that we talk about heart muscle disease is that you have to have these heart muscle involvement to really be, um, you know, to be actively screened. It, once again, it comes back to early screening uh, is, in our mind, an imperative. So we've been seeing all aged carrier moms in our clinic um, and uh, have had a very, um, a very interesting and robust response to that because I think much of the information about the risk for moms uh, and dilated cardiomyopathy just isn't promoted. It just isn't discussed. And what's been interesting to us is that many of the mothers uh, inquire, why have we not heard much about this before? And I think it's because one of those areas that just hasn't been explored very much. And so for us, it's an opportunity, I think, to really deliver complete care to the family, not only to the boy or the boys that are in the family with Duchenne or Becker, but also uh, the moms and uh, it's very important for their quality of life, in our opinion, to be good because they're such uh, heavily invested into uh, the caregiving of their children. And so maintaining good cardiovascular health is, is, a, is a premium. So uh, if you have specific questions about yourself or about more information about uh, risk, we'd be glad to discuss that via email. So we have a question from Stacy who asks, what age can a child with Duchenne start into research studies? Dr. Tobin. Any age. That's right. Any age that you're seeing uh, is a good age to 
have research studies. Um, clearly, you have to ask questions of what the studies are, why they're being done, what people hope to uh, gain from those studies. Um, so you're educated as a participant. Uh, but certainly, the only way the medical world and scientific world learn is through doing research studies. And when you're doing it on human disease, it means that humans have to participate. So uh, as a consumer, you're a consumer of research as well. Um, and be participatory, but ask questions. Those are all always good rules of thumb. So any age, we're happy to have people with interest. And um, um, we're happy to have people who are local or distant participating in any of our studies. Uh, so if you're interested, again, in how to find us, uh, just uh, you know, contact us with um, an email or some such approach, and we will be happy to talk to you about what we have. I think it ties into the other question. Yes, so Christine asked, what research studies are you offering? It, unfortunately, I probably don't have enough time to explain all the research studies that we're offering, but we actually have a compiled list uh, across neurology, pulmonary medicine, cardiovascular medicine for our institution. Um, that, in, that uh, gives in great detail all the studies that are ongoing. And we'd be glad to provide that to you via email. And the one thing we didn't mention is that all the responses we send via email, we can make available um, to those uh, that are listening or, or watching. Um, but we do have some very focused research studies currently leveraging some of this MRI technology that I was telling you about, so early detection of cardiovascular disease. A very basic study, but one that is of huge importance that Dr. Tobin alluded to earlier is the idea of heart rate variability, something that we've known about for many years in adults that have heart muscle disease. How does that tie into prediction of the onset of overt heart muscle dysfunction? In our experience, one of the first um, sort of clinical signs that we appreciate in patients that have failing heart muscle is an elevated heart rate. But as you also heard, that can mean a lot of other things as well, from infection to uh, pulmonary processes. So it's very important for us to discriminate what is the cause. But if we see problems with heart rate variability, it makes us pay very close attention to that patient, recognizing that that may be a heralding event of future cardiovascular risk. So those are some of the basic ones, but we have a lot going on from a drug therapy perspective, um, from imaging perspective. And it's not just about cardiovascular, it's about a lot of other um, uh, uh, concomitant disease processes going on in the muscular dystrophy population. So please uh, contact us and we'd be, provide, we'd be more than willing to provide that list to you. Another straightforward one that um, simply requires information is uh, the concept that the position of the mutation in dystrophin may herald the early or late onset and severity of the heart muscle problem. Um, and that's a collection of mutation analysis uh, and uh, clinical features of the heart uh, for us to better understand mm -hmm. whether or not a deletion in a certain part of the dystrophin gene will lead us down the path of identifying an earlier onset or have you more protected uh, from a later onset abnormality. Uh, so real clinical impact uh, based on that information. There's some known about it. We've published on that question. We're looking to do more. So those are the kinds of things that actually impact the day-to-day -day care that we might be able to provide moving forward. I think the other thing of importance is that some of these technologies we're utilizing are um, uh, lending themselves to advanced research questions such as this uh, idea of looking for SCAR on magnetic resonance imaging. If we were relying on our standard approach, which is still the standard approach in most institutions across the United States looking at echocardiography, we would never be able to give you an idea if SCAR existed in the heart muscle utilizing standard uh, transthoracic echo. Utilizing MRI, now we can see if there's SCAR, but then now if we appreciate there's SCAR, then, then that begets the question, well, what do you do about it? Are there treatment options available for that? And that's one of the ongoing studies that we have at our institution that we're hugely interested in, meaning looking for SCAR, and if it's evident, is there any potential therapeutic options that we have to treat that? And the answer is yes. And so we do have ongoing investigation in that, in that area. So Cinnamon asks our next question,
Do you recommend aspirin therapy on a 14-year-old boy with Duchenne muscular dystrophy who has no cardiomyopathy symptoms as, as of his last cardiac MRI? No. no. And so, I would so concur. It's very straightforward. So, um, you know, you have to recognize, and I think that's the uh, important piece about medical therapies, is that without some sort of an indication for the therapy, medicines have side effects. And so for aspirin therapy, those may manifest as irritated uh, stomach lining or gastritis, development of ulcers, which could cause really serious problems from a bleeding perspective, inability to eat, uh, significant abdominal pain. They, uh, aspirin use can impair renal function or kidney function. So those things are very important. And aspirin, uh, as a traditional sort of prophylactic therapy, has been more approached from a coronary artery disease or atherosclerotic perspective which in a patient at 14 with no other overt risk factors, we would have a very low suspicion for. So I think what we would say, that the potential benefits probably don't outweigh the potential side effects. And so utilization with a normal cardiac MRI, no evidence of non-compaction, as we heard from a previous question, there really wouldn't be a clear-cut indication to utilize aspirin therapy. That answer would be different if the ventricle wasn't squeezing exactly. normally. Yeah. So in a normal scenario, no. In the abnormal scenario, yes. Yeah. So um, we, uh, Brandon asks, um, what are you doing to prevent heart issues in muscular dystrophy, Dr. Tobin? Well, the best prevention uh, is to be seen and mm -hmm. seen on a routine basis. That's not going to prevent the disease from developing. But what it will do is identify the earliest time frame when the heart is starting to not work allowing us to provide early therapy, and in our opinion, reducing the likelihood of progression. So having a heart that doesn't squeeze completely normal, it's a little bit mildly abnormal, that's not a problem, that's not gonna cause an issue. The issue becomes when it progresses, progresses over time. And so the best way to prevent it is to not let things progress. Early detection, early therapy, reduction of the ability to progress equals long outcome. And hence, at least in our patient population over the past decade or more, uh, we've suddenly started taking care of many 30 and beyond patients, which we didn't have the luxury of taking care of previously. And that's, I think, early diagnosis, early therapy leads to much better outcome. So it's a partial answer. There is no magic at the moment. I wish there was, but we're still, that's the research question. Right. So Jess asks, my son is only six months old. Is there any kind of screening that could be done for heart issues in DMD? And the answer is yes. Um, you know, our standard approach for someone at this age would be using one of the, just doing a standard echocardiogram. So one that uh, wouldn't require sedation well, we could get a good idea of the size of the heart, the way that the heart squeezes. And that's with the understanding that at six months of age, it would be exceedingly unusual for us to see evidence of dilated cardiomyopathy. But it doesn't mean that screening is not a possibility in someone at six months of age. And so our standard approach would be to do an echocardiogram and continue, as, as you've heard multiple times from both of us, it's not about this initial intake. You have to recognize that this is not a one-time deal seeing a cardiologist, that this is going to be a part of your ongoing care for the rest of his life. Um, we'll take one more question. Um, uh, let's see. Um, we have from Angela who asks, what is the typical age that cardiomyopathy begins to affect DMD boys? So um, Dr. Jeffries and I published a paper some years ago that actually looked at that along with the question of the mutation analysis. And in that patient population uh, that we studied, uh, the DMD boys had an age of onset of ventricular dysfunction at about age 15, one five. Uh, the Becker uh, children, which was a much smaller group, uh, tended to be a little earlier, at least in that very small population, about 14 years of age. So tends to be early in um, post-pubertal, uh, but we've certainly seen younger children. We've seen kids 9 and 10, for instance, that have developed heart muscle disease, at least one 10-year-old uh, 
with quite substantial uh, LV dysfunction and dilated cardiomyopathy, that seems to be much less common. So typically, around the age of puberty tends to be your time frame, more or less. So with that, I think we would both like to, to thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak with you this evening. Um, we would encourage you uh, to contact us with ongoing questions. Uh, we would ask you to email us at cardiomyopathyteam at cchmc.org if you have any additional questions. And uh, a member of our team will answer your email within 48 hours. So once again, thank you for the opportunity, and we look forward to hearing from you.